So what you see is on the left corner, the Chinese character, right? And that Chinese character is pronounced Tai at the fourth tone. And it means supreme peace, even if here it's simply translated as peace. So on the right upper corner, you see above Kun, the receptive, the earth. So an hexagram is counted from the bottom one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so the upper trigram above, you see there are three broken lines. Okay, so the lines four, five, and six is called the upper trigram. And the upper trigram here is made by the trigram Kun or Earth, the receptor. And lines one, two, three is the trigram pronounced Qian in Chinese, and it's heaven or the creator. So I said the first time that the I Ching, the classic of change and of the unchanged, because once again, what is special about E is that it means at the same time change and unchanged. So it is change is for time and unchanged is for timelessness. So it is about the dance of time and timelessness. So, at the core of the Yi Ching, I said last time that there is a document called the Zhou Yi, meaning the changes of the Zhou dynasty, corresponding to 4,400 characters. What we see here is the translation pertaining to that core 4,400 characters. In that core translation, you have the name, the character, the trigram, Okay, of course, in the Chinese uh, document, you don't have the explanation that above is Kun and below is Qian because the Chinese understood spontaneously those things. And you have the judgment. So the judgment, peace, the small departs, the great approaches, good fortune, success. Okay, so the judgment on the hexagram, according to tradition, those judgments have been written by King Wen of the Zhou Dynasty. King Wen was born in, in 1112 and he died in 1050 BCE, of course. And after that, you have the image. Normally, the image here is divided in Ta Xiang, meaning the great images, and Xiao Xiang, the small images. Here we only have the great image, meaning that it is a explanation of the upper trigram made by Kun, Earth, or the receptive, and of the lower trigram, Qian, the creative. That is the Ta Xiang, the great image. The small image would give an explanation about each line of the hexagrams. For that, you have to go in the appendix with the philosophical explanation. So let's focus on the image, meaning the great image about the hexagram made by the upper trigram and the lower trigram. So the explanation about the image is the great image. Heaven and earth unite. So heaven, line one, two, three. Earth, line four, five, six. They are together to make that hexagram, which is the number 11. That is the image of peace, okay? Because meaning, let's not forget that the hexagram from the philosophical perspective is the great union, okay, Ta Yi Tong, as I said, that because in the philosophical Confucian tradition, the goal of universal history is to travel, to journey to a society of perfect justice, meaning that it is no more right, uh, might makes right, but my serving right. So heaven is the dimension of timelessness and earth is the dimension of time. Once again, earth, epistemologically speaking, means the senses perception, the intellect and social sophistication and heaven at a timeless form of beauty, goodness and truth, 
translated in time as the powers of the mind capable of creating justice for beauty, for goodness, the powers of the mind capable of valor, humanity, creativity, discovery, and inventivity, and truth corresponding in time to the powers of the mind capable of wisdom. So here the image is heaven and earth unite, the image of peace. Of course, if the human animal, meaning the, the qualities of the human animal being the sense perception, the intellect and social sophistication, if those mental qualities are united to the timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth, it is sure that it won't create peace on earth. Thus, the ruler divides and completes the course of heaven and earth. Okay, divides and complete the course of heaven and earth, you have to understand here, he will make the difference between what is the lower trigram, earth, the animal kingdom, and the upper trigram, heaven. But he will make them united. He furthers and regulates the gifts of heavens and earth. Okay, so it means that the animal kingdom component is important and the divine reality is also important and so adds the people, which is a simply a natural consequence. Okay, so thus the ruler divides and completes the course of heaven and earth. He furthers and regulates the gifts of heaven and earth and thus, and so adds the people, if I read the text. The lines. So when I read at the beginning, it means the first line, right? Because we have six lines. Nine means, nine is another way to say yeah, okay? Nine at the beginning means when ribbon grass is pulled up, the sod comes with it. Each according to his kind, undertakings bring good fortune. Okay, so here let's not forget that epistemologically it corresponds to the line of senses perception. So it means that here you have to take it metaphorically. Okay, when ribbon grass is pulled up, the sod comes with it. Okay, so it is something that is natural, that is part of the animal kingdom. Nine again, which is a yang line, of a whole line. In the second place means bearing with the unconscious in gentleness fording the river with resolution, not neglecting what is distant, not regarding one's companions, thus one may manage to walk in the meadow. Okay, so it here it's very interesting. One may manage to walk in the meadow. Let's not forget once again that line two epistemologically correspond to the intellect, okay? Wording, conceptualizing, imaging. So one of the defects of the intellect is going into extreme, okay? Rather pessimism or rather optimism, but never centrality. So if you one may manage to walk in the meadow, it is the way to use the intellect in an appropriate manner. Because most of the problems of our species, the human species, is that when we get into the, let's say, the... Uh, frenzy imagination of the intellect because uh, in the I Ching uh, language, imagination is part of the intellect because let's not forget the intellect is wording, conceptualizing and imaging. Uh, there are other things to say, but I don't want to, I, I want to pass to the next because I would like to interact more in the question period. And uh, we don't have to have the question period at the at absolutely at the end, okay? After each phases, if there are questions, I can talk to them, uh, I can address them rather than waiting for the end. So the next section is nine in the third place means no plane not followed by a slope, no going not followed by a return. He who remains persevering in danger is without blame. Do not complain about this truth. Enjoy the good fortune you still possess. Once again, I always remind 
the value of the line. Line three correspond to the epistemological stage of the social sophistication, okay? So here, we also have a kind of advice concerning the natural course of thing. Six as the fourth place means, okay, let's not the fourth, forget that the fourth place is the first line of the upper trigram. So six means a broken line, right? He flustered down, not boasting of his wealth, together with his neighbor, guileless and sincere, okay? So let's not forget that it's not for nothing that I chose hexagram number 11, because hexagram number 11 gives basic definition, okay? But because let's not forget, once again, that line four epistemologically correspond to the timeless form of beauty, E in Chinese, but E means justice, meaning, meaning the highest form of beauty and corresponding to the powers of the mind capable to uphold justice in time. So here, together with his neighbor, guileless and sincere, is a definite possible definition of justice among many definite possible definitions of justice. Six in the fifth place means, so six once again means a broken line. The fifth Why? place is, yes? Just yes? a quick question about that E. Is that spelled just with an I? And is that the uh, same word in the I Ching? Uh, no, it's not the same E. Uh, the, the, the transliteration with the alphabet is Y and I at the fourth tone. But uh, the Chinese don't pronounce the Y. So it's the same as you have uh, uh, an E in English, you know, the, the fifth letter. You pronounce that, uh, the fifth letter in English, but at the fourth tone, E. And it's not the same that the I Ching, it's not the same characters, if that's what you mean. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, so, uh, six at, in the fifth place means the sovereign, okay, one again, fifth place means the timeless uh, form of uh, goodness, translating in time as valor, creativity, inventivity, and discovery. Uh, and so the sovereign gives his daughter in marriage this bring blessing and supreme good fortune. And once again, I repeat, I chose the hexagram 11 because it's a kind of theoretical summary. The line five, line, the fifth line or line five correspond to the place of the sovereign, okay? Because epistemologically it corresponds to valor and humanity and creativity, but socially, hierarchically in the fair society, the fifth line corresponds to the line of the sovereign. The fourth line corresponds to the line of the minister. The third line corresponds to the line of the officer. The second line corresponds to the line of the petty officer. And the first line of the sense of perceptions correspond to the line of the commoners. Okay, from the, fourth, the first line, I jump now to the sixth line to finish the reading. Six at the top, meaning the sixth line. So six, the broken line at the top, meaning the sixth line, means the wall falls back into the moat. Use no army now. Make your commands known within your own town. Perseverance brings humiliation. So here, the thing that I would retain epistemologically, epistemologically is that it is the line of the philosopher king, okay? It is the line of wisdom, of truth in timelessness. The line that is meaningful, well, the five lines are meaningful, but what is meaningful is that make your commands known within your own town. Let's not forget that the six hexagram represent the mind of man. So at the top, even if I would say that we can say it at line five, the line of the sovereign, but it is absolute at line six, okay? Meaning that is the end of the epistemological development with the achievement of the state of a philosopher king, of a shangran uh, in Chinese, 
make your commands known within your own town. There are many, you can read it at a very low down to earth level, or you can read it as uh, symbolically your own town, meaning the whole lay six layers of your mind, that at line six, it is obvious that you are capable to make your commands known within the six layers because you are a master of yourself. I would say that from a practical standpoint, line five would correspond to what Plato called the aristocratic man or the Confucian is called the gentleman, Jun Tzu. It is already possible to talk about the fact that you can make your commands known within your own town, symbolically explaining that you are almost at the top of your epistemological development at line five, or completely at the top of your epistemological development at line six. Before going further, because my presentation will be more philosophical the, the, in this second session, if you remember at the first session, it was more of an introductory uh, presentation. Today, I want to stress more on the Shu Yi, the, and it's not the same Yi than justice, and it's not the same Yi than the I Ching, okay? It's a, it's a case of uh, 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 homo, uh, homo faults, meaning different characters pronounced at the, the same way. Uh, before going further, uh, do you have questions on that reading of the one of the 64 hexagrams? Yeah, Cathy, upper class or gentleman? Okay, okay, I see Nick. I see the electronic hand of Nick here. So please, Nick. Yeah, yeah thanks. Am I audible? Yes, perfectly. Go ahead. Okay. I have a, a general question on the very first picture you showed. Um, uh, you know, with the hexagram for Thai. Yeah, yeah. If you could show that, it will help me to to formulate uh, you, my question. You you mean the picture? You mean the the hexagram, the three broken lines uh, at the upper trigram and the three whole line at the uh, Shrikan. Can you go back to the top of the eleven hexagram, please, so that we can see uh, the figure? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, here it is. Thank you. Um, so the basic question is uh, is with regard to the upper right hand. Uh, so this uh, six lines are composed uh, by two parts, three broken lines, three unbroken lines. And uh, so the, for the broken lines, the the upper trigram, it's receptive, eh? receptive. Absolutely. And uh, the lower trigram, yeah? So would you, would you use a different word to indicate the opposite of uh, receptive instead of saying creative? Uh, could be dynamic, for example, or could be shining. Uh, could be uh, uh, having the taking the initiative. So I would say that the most the set, let's say that heaven and creative would be the most spontaneous. A third one would be dynamic. The fourth one would be shining, and the fifth one would be active. Yeah. Of so hope. what I'm trying. To get this contrast, uh, to to precisely understand the ancient Chinese thinking, the duality, you know, if we think the receptive is uh, accurate meaning for the upper trigram, the three broken lines, uh, what would be the precise opposite of that? Uh, the or if we think the creative was what they meant for the unbroken line, then what would be the precise opposite of 
creative, which I, I would think is destructive. But here, clearly, the two, the, the, the pair do not uh, contrast as sharply as uh, creative okay. versus destructive. Uh, I think that creative and receptive are perfectly contrasting. I will try to explain that. Uh, when you are in a dynamic relation, for example, the creative is someone who, who would give, okay? And here we think that, that we are all adults in this electronic room. Let's, if you think to a sexual intercourse, for example, the creative is the male, okay? The, the one who would penetrate. And the receptive is the female, the one who would receive the penetration, okay? So you have to think in terms of uh, precisely of dual complementarity of, of complementary duality, right? And um, the first basic meaning of the unbroken line or whole line is yang. And the basic meaning of yang is shining, okay? Sunny. And the basic meaning of the broken line is darkness okay so yang you have to think to something sunny something something uh, not uh, shining okay the perfect metaphor or even in physical reality is the sun for yang you may, maybe you know that in chinese uh, the sun is say uh, is called tai yang right uh, meaning the supreme light or the supreme yang okay that is for the sun and the moon is a perfect metaphorical representation for the yin. So yin yang is really moon, sun, or darkness, light. And I would say that that is really the basic, basic meaning, okay? Because let's not forget that the I Ching in prehistorical times, it was about uh, meteorological phenomena. So the second would be the creative or the receptive or the penetrating or the receiving, okay? But maybe receiving is more obvious because for me, creative and receptive are perfectly complementary or dynamic and passive, okay? Proactive, passive. That give the same idea too. And um, of course, the uh, giving. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, uh, if you're done, I have a question. Okay, please. I don't know if I answer completely to Nick. Uh, Nick if it's okay. Would you like a follow up? Okay, let's let's go on. I uh, think. Go ahead. No, if we can, if you have the follow up on this point, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Right, so um, so Quan, my understanding of uh, I Ching is very, very poor. So I have mostly ignorance. So I'm asking from ignorance. Um, I'm just, the first thing that I can see in the choice of this particular hexagon is that what would naturally be receptive at the bottom, so which would be like the first three lines, is at the top here. And what would be naturally creative, which would be the four, five, six lines, is at the bottom. What is the meaning behind that? Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that you saw that, Srikan. <laughs> Before I suggest my answer, which is the traditional answer, I would like to ask you, Srikan, do you have some hypothesis? Ah, I have a hypothesis. I don't know how true it is going to be, how good it is going to be. Um, I think in some ways, I think this hexagon is very special uh, because what it is, seems to be showing, it's like, I mean, I'll use the term heaven and earth. It is bringing heaven to earth and pulling earth to heaven and thus uniting the two in a very profound integration. That's what I see. You see very well, Shrikan, that is the traditional explanation, okay? In the sense, the natural movement of heaven is to go upwards. The natural movement of earth is to go downwards, but they are not in their so-called natural positions. And it represents peace because here 
because earth will go natural downwards and heaven will go natural upwards, heaven and earth will move in order to meet each other and to intimately unite. And that is the preconditions for supreme peace. Okay, fantastic. So then another follow-up question. What is the hexagon? What is the meaning of the hexagon when the creative is at the top and the receptive is at the bottom? What hexagon it is and what is its meaning? Okay. I don't remember exactly, so I have to go to the chart sure, and I will please. give you the number. Yep. Okay, so superior, um, chin, and inferior. Okay, so it's the, the next one uh, is number 12. Uh, you can... You can go to the uh, next one uh, on the uh, on the, the electronic document that I sent you, Shrikan. Is there it is. The there next, it is. Yeah, number 12 yep. is mean stagnation. When heaven is above and earth is below, when each of the two are at their natural place, it gives rise to stagnation because the heaven being naturally up will stay there and earth being naturally down will stay there, there, and there is no interaction and no union. So it gives rise to stagnation. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. And I think this is a good place, good way of starting, because we're seeing like all three together, in the sense that like all the, the upper trigram is either all whole lines or all broken lines. So kind of seeing these pair together, I think it's a very, very good. So I'm really delighted that you started with uh, exam 11. Thank you. Yes, because uh, my pleasure, because exam 11 is a kind of uh, philosophical summary. Yes, wonderful. Uh, if you want to say something more, please go ahead. Otherwise we'll go to Nick. Uh, I will go to Nick now. So please, Nick. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just to finish up this discussion for me. Uh, so as you can see, you know, this um, upper and lower trigram uh, show up in all of, all of the places. Uh, um, so the point I was trying to make uh, is that um, uh, the creative was the term used uh, uh, in the classical translation by Richard uh, Willem. I don't know what the German word he used. I don't know whether you know or not. Uh, if you know, Guan, that would be helpful to, to share. Uh, but uh, but the, the, the fact that this word has been used and been adopted uh, throughout the years uh, uh, in translation actually created a perception that we are imputing more meanings to this ancient Chinese classics uh, in the way the Greeks formulated their thoughts. You know, the Greeks uh, thought about being and becoming, you know, destructive and then coming into being and, and, then, and then disappear. That, that is one way of thinking. But Yi Jing, as you can see, if you are thinking about the opposite of receptive, it's not really creative. So for the ancient Chinese thinking, the idea of uh, uh, natility, creative, and destructive, that, that, that's there. I, I'm pretty sure that was there, but wasn't the dominant thinking. Rather, the receptive versus the opposite of receptive play a crucial role, role in their formulation of the duality of the negative and positive, yin and yang, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to put that on the table as an alternative perspective in understanding this, uh, this work. Uh, otherwise, we will be you know, thinking that the Chinese were, were thinking the similarly as the Greeks uh, at the same time. Uh, I would like to, uh, to, to answer to you by reading to you the beginning of the Ta Chuang, okay? Because let's not forget that I, it was on purpose that I show the hexagram first because uh, what we saw 
above the hexagram is part of the primitive part of uh, the document. Let's not forget that the I Ching is made by the Chou Yi, 4,400 characters. And it was a document who has been written about uh, around 1000 BCE, right? So 3000 years ago. That primitive part, I tend to agree with you. But there is a philosophical elaboration between 500 BCE and 300 BCE, which are express, which is expressed in what is called the Shu Yi, the 10 wings and representing 20,100 characters. Okay, so it's about 80% of the I Ching. So the I Ching is made by a primitive document called the Chou Yi, the changes of Chou, 4,400 characters, and a philosophical elaboration written five centuries to seven centuries later, okay, between 500 BCE and 300 BCE. So it is absolutely right, as you said, that at the primitive layer 3,000 years ago, uh, talking about being, becoming would not be appropriate. But let's not forget that the I Ching is a document putting together two layers of meaning, the layers of the time period of 1000 BCE and the layers of 500 BCE to 300 BCE that is called Shi Yi, the Ten Wings, okay? Those two together form the I Ching. Uh, so it's legit, what you say is legit for the primitive layer, but the, 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 the philosophical layers wouldn't tackle the philosophical concepts. And I want to read the, a, uh, the beginning of wing number five. Uh, okay, it's the occasion for me to list the 10 wings at least once. <clears throat> okay, so the 10 wings are made of wing one and two me about what is called the Tuan Chuan, T-U-A-N, Chuan, Z-S-U-A-N. So Tuan means decision, judgment. So Chuan means commentary. is in wing one and wing two. Why the Tuan Chuan is not only in wing one? Because in, in chapter one, okay, wing one, you have uh, the commentary for the exagrams one to 30, and in chapter two or wing two, you have the commentary for hexagram 31 to 64. So it's as simple as that, okay? So the Tuan Chuan is about the commentary on the decisions or on the judgment. Chapter three and chapter four is about the images, okay? So I said that you have the Ta Xiang, the great image about, uh, which is a Ta Xiang, well, you have the Xiang Chuan, meaning commentary on the images. And chapter three is Ta Xiang, meaning the great images. And those are the commentary on the upper trigram and the lower trigram. Xiao Chuan or Xiao Xiang, meaning the commentary on the smaller images, or to be precise, the commentary on each of the six lines. After that, you have uh, the Van Yen, uh, the, the five and six, which is Ta Chuang, the great commentary, part one and part two. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Seven is Van Yen. It's a philosophical commentary on hexagram one and two, meaning heaven and earth, Qian and Kun. After that, you have uh, chapter eight, it's about Shuo Hua, okay? It's about the, the trigram. And the, chapter nine is Xu Hua. It's about the explanation on the sequence of the uh, trigrams. And finally, Zha Hua is about miscel miscellaneous explanations on the trigrams and the hexagram, okay? So now that I have listed at this once what I mean by the Shu Yi, the 10 wings, the philosophical explanations representing 80% of the I Ching, okay? I think I repeated for the fifth time, but it's important to remember 
that 20% of the I Ching, 4,400 characters, is the primitive part 3,000 years ago. 20,100 characters, 80% of the I Ching, is the philosophical elaboration having been written five centuries after the primitive document. Okay, Traditionally, it has been attributed to Confucius and Confucius was born in 551 BCE and he died in 479 BCE. According to the scholars, it has been elaborated between 500 BCE and 300 BCE. So for those who don't believe that Confucius wrote in its entirety, the 10 wings, the scholarly consensus for now in 2024 is it has been written by different scholars and put together between 500 BCE and 300 BCE. And those considerations are philosophical. It's not uh, uh, the primitive document 3,000 years ago. I would like to read the section one of wing five, meaning the great commentary, okay? You would, as heaven is above and earth below, so Qian and Kun are one above the other. As high and low places are spread about, so higher and lower lines are set out. As movement and repose are normative, so home and broken lines are distinguished, okay? As movement and repose are normative, we are here in the domain of becoming and being. Before I keep on reading the text, I would like to remind that the German Richard Willem has been guided in his translation by a Chinese scholar having received the imperial classical education. And the name of that gentleman was Lao Nai Xuan. Lao it was his family name, L-A-O Nai Xuan. N-A-I-X-U-A-N was his given name. So the philosophical interpretation as translated by uh, Richard Willem in, and published in 1923 and translated from German to English by Carrie Baines and translated uh, and published in 1950 was not the product of uh, the wine imagination of Richard Willem. Uh, the scholar Lao Nai Swan chose Richard Willem because Richard Willem possessed precisely those receptive qualities uh, making him capable to receive uh, the representation of the world uh, of a foreign civilization. That being said, I keep on reading a little, a little bit the first part of the Ta Chuang because I have no intention to read all of that, but just to give you an idea. As events are of different kinds and things can be classed uh, in groups. Quan, just the interruption. Uh, yes, I have please. to take a call for a few minutes, so please handle the moderating. Yes, please. Thank yes, you. yes. Uh, so as events are of different kinds and things can be classed in groups, so good and ill auspices are generated as figures are formed in heaven and shapes are formed on earth. So alternation and transformation appear. Thus, whole and broken lies replace one another the A trigram combined with one another as thunder and lightning stimulate, wind and rain fertilize, sun and moon moves in their courses and after coal comes heat. And here I want to read another section which is always, which is still in section one. The Tao of Qian forms a maleness, the Tao of Kun forms a femaleness. Qian conceives the great beginning. Kun brings things to completion. Qian conceived with great spontaneity. Kun is empowered with simplicity. Spontaneity is readily recognized. Simplicity readily follow. 
What is readily recognized is accepted. What is readily followed brings success. What is accepted can endure. What brings success can grow great. Endurance is the wise man's power. Greatness is the wise man's task. Being and simplicity means grasping the principles of all under heaven, right? Being and simplicity means grasping the principles of all under heaven. We are here in the midst of a philosophical document, not of a primitive divination manual, which was simply the springboard for later philosophical elaboration that I'm reading some of the text to you right now. Grasping the principles of all under heaven means finding one's proper place in their midst. There are a lot of things that I want to read to you about that uh, Ta Chuang, the great commentary, which are chapter four and five of uh, the 10 wings, but I stop here for now because they are, I would have occasion later on to read those stuff. Now, I would ask people to ask their question, to interact with them. If I'm making a mistake because I don't see everyone, I don't necessarily see all, all hands, don't be shy to, to tell me that I'm wrong, right? What I see now is Joe's hand. So Joe, please. Thank you, Quan. Quan, and I apologize if you've explained this already, but I'm new to this document so or to this book, and so it's it's immensely interesting. But and I'm trying to unload the Christian concept of heaven. So would you be able to explain in this book in the I Ching when they talk about heaven? I, I mean I see creative, but could you maybe more broadly explain what they're referring to? Yes. Uh, first, I want to be sure what you mean by the Christian concept of heaven. Are you speaking of paradise? Yeah, you know, the whole concept up in the heavens and that's okay. where we end up in that whole concept. Okay. If we agree that the Christian of heaven is paradise, I would make the difference with the Chinese concept of heaven. Thank okay. you. So heaven in the Chinese concept means uh, being. Okay, timelessness or principles. If I have to choose a, one word to translate the heaven, I, I would say the Tao, okay? but that would be given another Chinese word. Okay? So if I have to choose one English word, I would say being or principles or uh, timelessness. That's all my three favorite English words for translating heaven. Timelessness, being, uh, and uh, uh, principles. Earth, if I have to use three English words to, uh, to make the pair, if you want, uh, with being, you have becoming, okay? So heaven would be being, and the pair, uh, which is earth, in uh, poet poetically speaking, would be becoming, being and becoming. If we with if I use principles for heaven, it would be principles and phenomena. Okay, uh, fin principles and phenomena. Principle means the thing that we can uh, understand in a abstract manner. Okay, and phenomena are what we see with our sense of perception. Okay, that is another pair for heaven and earth. Another the third pair of heaven and earth, of course, is timelessness for heaven and time for earth. That would be my three pairs of English translation for heaven and earth. So when you see about creative, for example, okay? So uh, the principles are the causes of uh, what appears as phenomena, okay? And that is the, the dance of the creative versus the receptive, or if you prefer, the produce, okay? the the, the the creator and the uh, creature. But here, maybe uh, we are close to Christian terminology, but you understand what I mean. Thank you. I don't know if I answer completely to your question. It helped. It really okay. helped. Thank you so much.
okay. Uh, okay, so uh, don't hesitate to come back for a follow-up question if you have uh, other interrogations. For now, according to what I can see on my tablet, there's no other questions, so don't be shy. Ask me questions. <laughs> I well, see I Joe. Oh, yes. I, I, it's Mark speaking, I think. Yeah, I thought someone had their hand up, actually, but uh, it might have been, uh, I think it was put down. Okay. Anyway, uh, do you have any question, Mark, by the way? Yeah, I think Joe had his hand up, but he put it down. Okay, Joe, Mark, do you no, want I to actually, ask? I just got into oh, the meeting. Okay. Hi, Joe. Good so, to see you. Good to see you. And, uh, uh, okay, Mark? My question to follow up on the previous one is that if we, <clears throat> heaven is timelessness, being, and principles. But this being is active. You know, if we think in terms of Greek categories of being and becoming, it's often the becoming that we think of as something which is in motion, which is active, and the being is somewhere in a transcendent you know, universe space where it's not really doing anything. But I think being here, you're saying, as one of the principles of heaven, is active. Absolutely. Uh, I would say that uh, in the Chinese uh, framework, uh, being is the cause or the source or the fountainhead, okay? If I remember, I go back to Tao Te Ching. Uh, the left component of Tao is a, a, a character for moving, and the right component is a character for head or for fountain head. So you have uh, time and timelessness. Uh, Te is the same. Okay, on the left side of Te you have a character for movement, and on the right side you have the heart. The, directed to righteousness, to, to justice, to what is true. And Qing, the same. On the left, you have the character for moving. And on the right, you have the character for the three, the loom, okay? The, uh, the timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth. But in the Chinese framework, you, I think you're right. Being is dynamic. And but it's not the same dynamism than becoming, because becoming is movement, but it's movement as the consequences of the inherent dynamism of being, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, both are dynamic, but one as causality and the other as consequences. Uh, I think that I have Joe and after Nick, if I'm not mistaken. So go ahead, Joe. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. I'm just got in here. So I'm just, um, okay. So what you're talking about here is essentially uh, looking at it from like the metaphysical and the physical, right? Yes. That, if, uh, sorry, I interrupted you. Please uh, go ahead. No, yeah. Essentially, you know, the idea that, um, one is kind of when you say eternal or timeless that you know these are kind of things like principles that were that are always true um and that whereas uh when we think about things that um earth itself we're thinking about basically the um the applications in our everyday lives so and how this actually manifests itself in the world and this is kind of this is contextual so um and so the idea obviously is within this is also how to understand change itself uh, i think you understood perfectly because if you see it dynamically uh, at the center you have uh, the trigram in circle, but according to what is called the sequence of FUSI, okay, F-U-X-I. -F the sequence of FUSI is for timelessness, meaning that the, the element of the, the eight trigrams are disposed in a perfect balance. 
And here I come back a little bit to Mark's question. Because in the Chinese framework of thinking, there is something resembling the Greek and something not resembling the Greek. Because the eight trigram are disposed in the sequence of Fusi as timelessness, meaning, but not moving timelessness, okay? And in that sequence, you have a, a fire opposing to water, for example, okay? And in the other sequence that is called the sequence of King One, one W E N, and once again he was the founding father of the Chow Dynasty. He was born in eleven and twelve B C E, and he died in ten fifty B C E. And the Chow Dynasty itself ruled between ten forty six B C E. Uh, it was his son who truly created the Chow Dynasty. So don't be surprised that King Wen died in 1050 BCE, but the Chow Dynasty was created four years later in 1046 BCE because it was his son, King Wu, who went truly started, who truly started the Chow Dynasty. And they ruled truly till 770 BCE, as I said many times. And the five century between 770 BCE to 256 BCE when they were destroyed, they still retain a control influence and they play as a religious figures, okay? A role as religious figures, okay? So, so you have the sequence of the trigram by Fusi at the center, which is non-moving timelessness, but see it as a second concentric circle, which is the A trigram, but put in the sequence of King One. In the sequence of King One, you have thunder, wind, and after that you have uh, fire, you have earth, uh, you have a uh, lake, uh, you have uh, heaven, and you have water, and you have a uh, mountain, okay? In that sequence that I, I mentioned the eight trigrams in order, it is timelessness, but moving timelessness. And after that, you have uh, the 64 hexagram put in circle, I wouldn't, I don't know if you wouldn't see it. I wouldn't try to make you see it. Okay, I think that you see, uh, uh, ignore the uh, the uh, hexagram that are at the center. You see the 64 hexagram, but put in a circle, okay? You see it? Yes. So those 64 hexagram put on a circles are the third concentric circle, okay? So the first concentric circle are the eight trigrams in the sequence of FUSI, F-U-X-I. The second, con which is timelessness, but in perfect balance, so not moving, being, but you have being dynamic, okay? That is the eight trigram, but put in the sequence of King One. And once again, I repeat the order, thunder, wind, fire, earth, lake, heaven, water, mountain, okay? That is timelessness, but dynamic in movement. And finally, the third concentric circle is precisely the circle of the 64 hexagram that I just showed you. And those 64 hexagram, let's not forget that it is the symbol of what is called in Chinese Shu. And that Shu, I wouldn't explain the uh, meaning of uh, the graph of Shu. Most of the time, Shu is translated as a situation, but I prefer the Greek word Kairos to translate that, K-A-I-R-O-S, okay? Kairos is a channel, is a communication between time and timelessness, time and timelessness. So the Chinese character that is pronounced Shu, S-H-I with the fourth tone, is written on the upper left part with the simplified character Han, on the right upper part with a ball, okay? And the lower part with force. So it is the force or the powers of the mind making you capable to handle a ball, but ball here has to be understood metaphorically when we speak of epistemology, meaning the forces of the mind making you capable to hand, handle, I'm sorry, the situation, okay, or a situation. So the 64 hexagram are precisely the synthetic representation of the 64 possibility. Why 64? 
because uh, you have uh, two basic symbols, okay? Broken line or whole line. And those, and those broken line whole lines can be uh, displayed on six layers. So it is mathematic. If you take two exponent six, you arrive at 64 possible permutations or possible results. It doesn't mean that it, you don't have other situation, but it is a synthetic representation of the archetypal situation that are possible, okay? So the core philosophical answer is that you have being and becoming. And once again, I want to go back to the famous uh, Indian statue of the king of the dance, Nataraja. When you have uh, Shiva at the center symbolizing being and the circle of flames symbolizing becoming. And here you also have being, but being according to the, Fusi, the sequence of Fusi, timeless being, not moving. After that you have being in dynamic movement, the sequence of King One, and becoming as synthesized by the 64 hexagrams. I don't know if you have a follow-up questions or comments. No, I mean, I, I think that that actually makes sense. Um, uh, when, uh, and, I'm, and I was thinking about it in terms of um, how, yeah, energy essentially flows with, uh, when you were talking about, was it Shu, is it? A uh, Shu, yes, S-H-I, yeah, a Shu. Uh, maybe in English that would uh, help you to pronounce that. Imagine S H E U. Okay, sure. Okay. Okay, S H E. Uh, uh, for an English speaker, if I, he see S H E U, he would pronounce something like sure, right? That's correct. Um, yeah, well, that would be the right pronunciation for S H I at the fourth tone when transliterated with the pinging system. Okay. Um, no, you know I, that was. I'm, I don't have any more to follow up but right, right at this moment, but but that that actually makes sense to me. So, yeah. I think that so, you 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 explained the difference between the timelessness and time, um, and essentially you know, the uh, metaphysical and physical. Uh, exactly. And, how, how they actually work together is it becomes quite clear. Yeah. When you say metaphysical, you mean a being, of course. And when you say physical, you mean becoming, I suppose. Correct. That's okay. right. Okay. So I have to, I see two hands, but I see Nick's hand. And who is the other? Uh, I don't see the other hands, but uh, my machine indicates to me that there are two hands. I only see Nick's hand. So I go to, oh, is it Mark? Uh, okay. I see your hand too, Mark. So uh, who was the first? I cannot tell. Uh, who would be it the first? Like, I think Nick would be first, and then it would be Mark. Um, yeah. And then, so, yeah, yeah. Then, uh, I don't see Srikant here. Yeah, he was uh, here. OK. If Yeah, Srikant uh, is with the phone call. So I have to, uh, to decide. OK, okay. Uh, Mark, if you don't mind, uh, let's go to Nick. And after that, I will go to you. Okay, let's go. Next. Yeah, but Mark, uh, do you have a follow up to your earlier question? If that's the case, uh, I'll yield to you. No, no, go ahead. Nick. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, if not, then I have a follow up to your earlier question or your earlier follow up to a previous question by Joe. Um, so, so exactly, uh, you know, in the way the Mark described the Greek uh, conception of heaven is very quiet, right? The gods sit there thinking, uh, 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 I move movers, uh, uh, by thinking they create everything, they move everything. But the Chinese or the ancient uh, Yi Jing's uh, formulation of heaven is very active, right? So whoever uh, yes. in the heavens is active, anything that is quiet, that is appear to be quiet, peaceful, are actually just the appearance of the balance of various forces underlining 
the 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 quietness in the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, the the conception by the Chinese uh, is different from the Greek concern that uh, there must be something that's uh, that's everlasting, that is uh, uh, separate, constant. Uh, otherwise, how could we have order? Absolutely. Given all the changes. So uh, for the Chinese, uh, that has never been a major concern. And for whatever reason, they accept the changes on surface as something normal. And they also think even transcend these uh, superficial changes uh, uh, in the heaven, there are also changes, activities. So I think that's the major difference in their formulation. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to describe all that by using the, the, the Greek uh, or, or Hebrew uh, idea of creation, you know, God created the word uh, through Logos uh, uh, in six days. Uh, I think that would be uh, extra meaning attached to this Chinese uh, work. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to jump in here to say one something which is fundamental. Uh, when in the translation by uh, Richard Willem, when he used the word creative, uh, it doesn't mean the creator in the Christian meaning of the word. Okay, word the creative is the creating principle okay so there is no personal god here it is uh, the creating principle the tao and i would like to uh, to make uh, maybe uh, an exception normally i should not read something from another document than the uh, I Ching, but i would cheat a little bit i would like to read stanza 25 from the tao te ching and after that I would like to read the section four of the Ta Chuang, which is uh, from the Ten Wings of the I Ching, okay? And I would like first to read the stanza 25 of the Tao Te Ching because it's about precisely what you are talking, Nick. And let's not forget that in the Chinese framework, you have the absolute immobile being with the sequence of Fu Si, and what is more perceived, like Chinese, if you want, is the sequence of King One, which is the dynamic sequence of the eight trigrams. And the third concentric circles is the 64 hexagram. But I don't want to go too more, more in it. I read stanza 25 of the Tao Te Ching on the Tao, precisely. Manifesting material in form unshaped, born before heaven and earth themselves. And here you have to understand heaven and earth in the physical meaning. Unseeing, unheard, above, apart, standing alone, ever true to itself, swinging in cycles that never fail, mother of heaven and earth in the physical meaning, it seems, but I know not how to give it names. Press, I shall dub it the moving way, the moving way, or call it by name, the all supreme. All supreme and passing beyond, passing beyond and reaching for, reaching for and reverting back. Indeed, the way is all supreme and heaven too and earth and man. The four things in this world supreme and among them, one is man who is bound to follow the rule of earth, as earth must follow heaven's rule, and heaven the rule of the way itself. And the moving way is following the self momentum of all becoming. Okay, let's not forget that the Tao Te Ching has been written around 500 BCE, and according to the scholarly uh, researchers right now, the Ten Wings, the philosoph philosophical part of the I Ching has been written between 500 BC and 300 BC. So it was more or less during the same time. And now I want to go back to the Ta Chuang, okay, the great commentary of the, of, uh, the Ten Wings. And I want to read section four 
of uh, part one of the of the great commentary, the Ta Chuang. E, being aligned with heaven and earth, can wholly set forth the Tao of heaven and earth. E looks up to observe the patterns of heaven and looks down to examine the veins of earth. Thus, it knows the causes of darkness and light, origins and ends. It comprehends the meaning of birth and death, how form and essence fuse in an entity lasting till the soul departs in alternation. Thus, it knows the condition of spirits and souls. Being in accord with heaven and earth, it does not go contrary to them. Its knowledge embraces all things and its Tao assists all under heaven. Thus, it does not err. Air, I'm sorry. Moving in all direction, it never drains away, but rejoices in heaven, knowing heaven's decrees. Okay, heaven decrees here has to be understood as knowing the principles, knowing timelessness, knowing being. Thus, it gives no anxiety, one who is at peace in the land, generous in good goodwill, and thereby able to love. Let's not forget justice, right? Uh, and also goodness, uh, creativity, inventivity, valor, humanity. E, model on heaven and earth transformation, never goes beyond them, follows the intricate courses of thing without exception, fathoms the, 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 the time of day and night uh, with perfect understanding. Thus, as spirits have no bounds, E has no embodiment. Section 5, because it's even clearer in Section 5. Now Ying, now Yang is called Tao, okay? And let's not forget that Tao is a synonym for heaven in the metaphysical meaning, in the meaning of being, of principles, of timelessness. Now Ying, now Yang is called Tao. Its continuation is goodness, its achievement is nature. Okay, good man see it and call it good will. Wise man see it and call it wisdom. Ordinary people use it daily, not knowing what it is. Hence the Tao of a superior man is exceptional. It shows itself in good will, but conceals itself in action. It stimulates all things and does not share the sages anxiety. Its overflowing power for the great task That's, is indeed sublime. Let's not forget that the great task, because those texts have been written between 500 BCE and 300 BCE. And I said to you that among the five classics of the Chinese classical education, you have the Kong Yang interpretation of universal history of the document called Chun Chu, okay? And in that Kung Yang interpretation, the direction of universal history is the great task. How you will evolve from a society where might is right to a society where might is serving right, okay? So that is the Ta Yi Tong or the great unity, or here it is called the great task. So I read again that paragraph. Hence, the Tao of a superior man is exceptional. It shows itself in good will, but conceals itself in action. It stimulates all things and does not share the sages' anxiety. Its overflowing power for the great task is indeed sublime. To be richly provided with it is called the great task. Its daily renewal is called overflowing power. Products, producing products is called E. Okay, let's not forget that E here is, is for change, but let's not forget also that E means, means change, but also means unchanged. Okay, so changing and unchanging, becoming and being. Products, producing products is called E. The making of figures is qian. Okay, qian is a Chinese word for heaven. So the making of figures is qian. Here it is about the, the timeless form. 
imitating the patterns is con, okay? Imitating the timeless form is earth, that is the time shapes. So here you have a perfect match with the platonic idea of making a figure is Qian, meaning timelessness is about the timeless form, but imitating their patterns is Kun. The earth becoming is an imitation of the heavenly patterns, okay? As in Platonic philosophy, the phenomenal reality is the products of the imitation of the timeless forms. Telling numbers to learn the future is called divination. Developing alternations are called events. All that yin and yang do not define is called spirit. So I stop here for that section five of the first part of the Ta Chuang, because for me, it is so crystal clear. That is why I take a certain time to read it. And if you want me to read it again, I would be absolutely delighted, but because I love that passage. Okay, now it's the time for Mark. All okay, right. Shrikan is uh, back. I'm back. So Mark, go ahead. Thanks. Mark? Thank you for treating us to that, Kwan. Uh, my question is about the eight trigrams. I'm trying to get it straight in my mind. Are there two different, the first and second concentric circles are both groups of eight trigrams, but in different order? Yes, I would like to show you um, a, a clumsy representation that I made. You see at the center, you have the eight trigram, the, the eight trigram is small. Okay, that is the sequence of full C F U X I. That's yeah. being, but uh, immobile. And uh, the a bigger trigrams is the trigrams in the dynamic sequence or the sequence of King One. Okay, so timelessness, immobile timelessness, and dynamic timelessness, and uh, around that, at the third sun concentric layer, would be the 64 exagram representing the flux of phenomenal reality, of time, if you want. Okay, now it's becoming clear. I see <clears throat> that when I look at a picture of the, uh, say, the Bagua that has the eight trigrams around it, I'm used to seeing the inner concentric circle of of uh, King King Fushi, right? Yes, yes. Because that's where you have heaven on top and earth below, and then water and fire on east and west, and yes. then you have wind and thunder balanced as the north east and the southwest. Uh, absolutely. Uh, if uh, Let's not forget that the, for the Chinese uh, representation, what is up is the south. Uh, let's not forget that. And what is down is the north, OK? So in the Fusi sequence, meaning the, the, the non-moving timelessness, you have a heaven uh, at the south, uh, and you have earth at the north. And in the sequence of uh, King One, uh, it is fire is at the south uh, and it's water is at the north. And or if you want, uh, in the sequence, the moving being is uh, thunder, wind, fire, earth, um, lake, heaven, water, and mountain, okay? Because let's not forget that when I begin with thunder and wind, Thunder is the, sim the absolute symbol of spring, okay? So the, the easiest way for me to remember the sequence is about the seasons, okay? So it starts with wood, green wood, meaning the spring, okay? And that dynamic sequence, let's not forget that in prehistorical time, what is the most obvious for that cycles of life? It's the seasons, okay? So wood, green wood, uh, thunder and winds are the perfect, a, a trigram for starting with spring, the dynamic sequence of being. All right, uh, Mark, you yeah. have a flow? go ahead. Well, 
I'm also fascinated by the way in which each trigram that represents one of the eight forces is is determined, is pictured in a sense. Like we know that heaven is, is given by the three unbroken lines. Earth is given by the three broken lines. And if you take water and fire, for example, it's, it's fascinating how water is depicted as an unbroken line surrounded by two broken lines, as if it's trying to say something about heaven moving between earth and fire on the other hand is two, two broken lines surrounded by to unbroken lines as if earth is flowing through heaven and and the, just the, the ways in which these are sandwiched together I, I i kind of learned that you're supposed to read them from the bottom up towards so thunder being a broken it being a, a an unbroken line bearing down on two broken lines is like heaven coming down and swatting the earth. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? That symbolic in interpretation is perfectly the traditional interpretation. I see here that, that we have people who can espouse this Chinese thinking very easily. Akwan, could you take us through the diagrams again, uh, you know, along the lines, uh, the, the triagrams uh, along the yes. lines that Mark is saying, uh, and uh, you, uh, what heaven is uh, and how it is. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, are you speaking of the, the sequence of Fusi and the sequence of King One that I just uh, show here? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, so if we take the sequence of uh, Fusi, which is at the center, all the elements are perfectly opposite to each other and they are perfectly in balance, okay? Heaven is just opposite to earth. Water is just opposite to fire. Thunder is just opposite to wind. And uh, lake is just opposite to mountain, okay? I, I think that here the uh, heaven and earth is obvious. Fire and uh, water is obvious. But why coupling thunder and wind because thunder is something that is more in the mind in the chinese mind thunder is something strong masculine and wind we all know that you can have very violent winds okay but in the chinese mind wind is something soft okay wind here you have to think about a breeze something soft so you have something strong and hard and something soft, hence the opposition of thunder and wind. And you have the thunder of mountain, which is a peak, and the and lake, which is a depression, okay? That, that coupling is easier to understand. Mm -hmm. So you have the eight trigrams uh, position in perfect opposition to each other. So that is the level of principle of a being perfectly immobile, because everything is the perfect balance. In the sequence of King One, it is not the same as, uh, order, okay? It starts with thunder, after that it goes to wind, and after that it goes to fire. Uh, have an image, okay? You have thunder, you have uh, wind, and you have, you have fire, okay? The other thing, way to understand that easily too is that thunder is associated with the beginning of spring, okay? Let's not forget that the eight trigrams can be sequenced in the sequence of King One as the eight, the five elements, okay? A wood for spring. After that, you have fire, earth, metal or gold, and water. Earth, fire and earth is for summer, okay? That's it's why you have the five, but it can be categorized under the, the four season. So wood is for spring, fire and earth is for summer, 
gold or metal is for fall and water is for winter. So you have the cycles of the four seasons and the eight trigrams in the order of thunder, wind, fire, earth, uh, lake, heaven, water, and mountain follows that cycles of the season. And that mm -hmm. is what is called being, but in dynamic progression, which is a sequence of thing one, rather than being in immobility, which is a sequence of Fu Si. And the first concentric circles is the sequence of Fu Si being in immobility. The second concentric circle is uh, the sequence of King Wan being but dynamic. And the third concentric circle is the different energetic configurations that are possible in the 64 hexagram. And here, uh, just ignore what is at the center. You look at the 64 hexagram, but this uh, display in circle. And so imagine that circle at the third out outer concentric circle. And that is the symbolic representation of uh, the interaction of being and becoming principle and phenomena of timelessness and time. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Kwan. Next up is going to be Joe followed by Nick. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things that you actually covered already since um, what I was initially going to say really quickly. Um, could thunder be seen as something thunder and wind can be, can that be seen as something like intention and intuition? Uh, that... Yes. Uh, be yes, because let's not forget that I gave the basic interpretation of the two sequences, but you have five layers of interpretation. The first layers is season, the, the, the four seasons, right? Mm -hmm. The second layers is the development of man, okay? The third layer is the development of man's mind. The mm -hmm. fourth layer is the development of a group, okay, of human beings. And the fifth layer, which is what those people are obsessed with the development of civilization, not let's not forget that. Always have in mind that the I Ching is the first of the five classics. The other five, four classics being the Shu Ching, the book of songs, the Shu Ching, the book of documents, the three books forming the, the book of rich, the classic on rituals. And finally, the most important that if you remember my image, the square for the epistemological development of four books and the, the triangle, which is the roof of the house for the five classics. At the center, you have the I Ching, but at the top, you have the spring and autumn, which is the philosophical historical book with three interpretation. And the major interpretation is the so-called Kong Yang interpretation, G-O-N-G-Y-A-N-G. And let's not forget that for the Kong Yang interpretation, the great task is to achieve my serving right, okay? That is the end goal of universal history. So absolutely, when you say, you, when you gave the, in the interpretation about the layers of the mind, you are at the third layers of the interpretation of the five elements, um, wood, fire, earth, gold, and water. Okay, because let's not for, never forget that you have the five layers of my, of interpretation of the of the five uh, elements correlating with the trigrams in the Fu Si sequence and with the trigram in the King One sequence. Thank you for that. I mean, and um, uh, that's actually very helpful. It gives me context for everything um, and a framework to think about it. The yes. other is uh, when you were talking about how uh, everything is an imitation of heaven. Um, is that yes. an idea uh, similar to platonic forms? Uh, but absolutely, uh, Joe. Uh, and now here I would abuse a little bit of your patience, okay? I would read again section five of the first part of the great commentary, Ta Chuang, okay? Because in the 10 wings or the 10 chapters, if there's only two that you need to read is chapter five and chapter six, meaning the great commentary part one and the great commentary part two, okay? Here I'm reading 
chapter five, meaning the first part of the Red Commentary and section five of that first part. Okay, so I read again. Uh, okay, so to avoid uh, being uh, lost in stuff, I will read the 60% uh, of that, what I call the 60% the which is important. Hence, the Tao of a superior man is exceptional, okay? I want to repeat again, those stuff have been written by scholars between 500 BC and 300 BC, and those men were completely obsessed with the fact that how man can create a great and everlasting civilization, okay? Don't forget that. And don't forget the house with the square of the epistemological development and the triangle representing the roof of the five classics of the control legacy of the Chow dynasty. So I read again. Hence the Tao of a superior man is exceptional. It shows itself in goodwill, but conceals itself in action. It stimulates all things and does not share the sage's anxiety. It's overflowing power for the great task, the great task one again, once again, creating the everlasting civilization where my serves right. It's overflowing power for the great task is indeed sublime. To be richly, richly provided with it is called the great task. Its daily renewal is called overflowing power. Products, producing products is called E. Okay, now the, 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 the section concerning your question. The making of figures is Qian. Qian is heaven, okay? The Chinese word for the hexagram for heaven. The making of figures is Qian. Imitating the patterns is Kun, okay? Imitating the patterns is Kun. Kun is the Chinese character for earth in the hexagram. Telling numbers to learn the future is called divination. Developing alternations are called events. All that is yin and yang do not define is called spirit. So I read the two lines. The making of figure is qian, heaven, timelessness, principles, being. Imitating the patterns, the patterns of what their patterns, the patterns of the figures of Qian, imitating the timeless form is Kun, okay? It's earth, it's the time shape. So absolutely. No, that, that, that makes a lot more sense too. And actually you can really clearly see the Tao in here. Um, every time you talk about the idea of goodwill and concealing action, I actually think about, uh, I think it's Tao 17, where the idea that there's leadership, but what it is to lead without leading, and that's kind of being in harmony uh, with with the Tao or in, in alignment with, with heaven as well. So Yeah, uh, you know. you're right. And uh, you give me the uh, uh, the temptation to read the some lines of section six of the, the first part of the Tao Chuang. As for Qian, okay, for heaven, as for Qian, in repose, it is concentrated. In action, it moves straight forward, and so its product are great. As for Kun, okay, earth, in repose, it is folded together. In action, it opens up, out, and so its products are vast. This vastness and greatness compare with heaven and earth. Alternation and development compare with the four seasons. In meaning, Yin and yang compare with the sun and moon in worth, spontaneity, and simplicity compare with transcendent power. I'm sorry, I, I raised my voice with transcendent power because again, those guys were completely obsessed with the creation of the gentleman, okay? The person capable to have the mind powers for justice, for creativity, for inventivity, for valor, and for wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Kwan. Next up is going to be Nick. Yeah, I just want to add a footnote to the earlier discussion uh, between Mark and Kwan on the combination of uh, different lines. Uh, um, so 
you know, when you think about it, you have this binary system. Uh, if you have six, uh, uh, you know, iterations, uh, you get uh, 64 uh, scenarios, 64 hexagrams, 64 outcomes. And you would think, uh, well, okay, you know, 64 meanings of that, you know, I could apply to life, whatever. Uh, but actually, um, the subtle message of the Yijing is that uh, there are more than 64. Yes. Uh, because in order to get the precise meanings, uh, each individual lines in each individual uh, scenarios are different. So therefore, Mark, uh, for example, if you see uh, a combination of three unbroken lines, you might think, wow, that means heaven. So it means heaven all over the place. No, actually not. Uh, you know, uh, uh, unbroken line in scenario 61 is uh, different from uh, the interpretation of it in scenario 35, for example. So all those six uh, um, lines, either broken or unbroken, are situated in one of the 64 outcomes. And therefore you end up with 380 some interpretations. And that makes the whole work is so dense and penetrable. Uh, so, and this is a, this has a philosophical implication, which is that uh, in a binary system, we have the combination of zero and ones, right? Zero and ones never change meaning in whatever combination. Uh, but here the Chinese uh, uh, are not saying that. They, they are saying the zero and ones or the unbroken or broken lines have a different meaning in different situations. Uh, so so that, that, that makes the interpretation of the hexagram very different uh, than just looking at the combination of those, uh, you know, broken line, unbroken lines, and then say, well, you know, there's something constant underneath all those histograms. No, they are not. There are, there are actually 380 some different meanings out there through at you. Yes, uh, I think that Nick here brings something very interesting. Uh, not only we can have a very different layers of interpretation just by what he said, and there are many tradition of how you can extract more exogram from the original exogram that you get by uh, moving the uh, yarrow sticks or by uh, tossing the coins. But I would say that uh, uh, there are a lot of scholars relating to that. Uh, the one that I prefer is Wang Pi. He was born in 226 uh, AD and he died 23 years later in 249. Uh, he stress a lot uh, the epistemological interpretation on the sixth line as the development of the minds and of the social responsibilities that you would be capable to fulfill uh, according to the development of your mind okay because i have i focus a lot on the epistemological development i just named one p but there are a lot of other scholars okay you have let's say two main lineages those who are like Wang Pi, who will stress more on the meaning and the principles. And in Chinese, it's called the, the Li Yi school. Okay, I mean, the, sorry, the Li, Li Yi school, meaning the, the school of principle and of uh, meaning. Okay, and that interpretation has been the dominant one during the 2000 years uh, or during the 18th centuries after Wang Pi, okay, of Imperial China. And you have another school, which is Xiang Shu, meaning the school of the images and of the numbers, which are more related to numerological speculations. And, well, maybe it's my own bias speaking, but which are more looked down by the scholars because there's, let's say, a lot of imagination and let's say in the worst cases of superstition. But once again, Maybe it's my biases speaking. Thank I you. don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Quan. 
So I want to follow up one thing on about the numbers here. Um, you know, here we can see the binary system throughout, whether it is two, four, eight, 64, or further. But there are 81 stanzas in the DAO, and that is raised to three. So what is the significance of the three in the DAO and two here? Well, I think that the three, for me at least, is spontaneous. That is about the, the three in one, is about the one. And the two here for me is about duality. Once again, it's about timelessness and time being and becoming principles and phenomena. That's my spontaneous uh, understanding. Okay. I don't know if you have another interpretation, Shrikan. No, I, I don't. It's more, more of a question. Then one last question here. You know, we've talked a lot about the two. We've talked a lot about the eight. We've talked about 64. What about the four? Uh, is there a way of using four uh, and kind of developing, uh, you know, kind of the thought around the four here? Yes. Well, the basic meaning of four in Chinese tradition uh, is what I already showed, but I like it so much that I want to show it again. Um, that's the... Um, that's the character king, okay. Uh, wow, I think you see it. Wow. So the first top horizontal line, the, the, the bottom line, the second horizontal middle line, the third horizontal top line, and the only vertical line. Okay. You have four elements, and uh, the vertical line is the fourth, which is exactly equivalent, equivalent to the Chandra Bindu of mm -hmm. the symbol Om in the Indian tradition. Okay, The elevation of awareness with your epistemological development. So once again, the first horizontal line is for line one and two of the hexagram. The middle horizontal line is one, line three and four of the hexagram. And the top horizontal line is line five and six of the hexagram, uh, corresponding to the epistemological development. And the character is pronounced Wang, meaning king, about uh, the kingly person having finished his epistemological journey. That is the basic meaning of four in the Chinese thinking framework. It corresponds also so for the, to the four seasons, okay? Because the whole year, the complete year, the achieved year, goes through the four seasons. So what would the vertical line be uh, in terms of seasons? That see, oh, that is, in terms of seasons, it can be, I would propose uh, that it is more spring, okay? Because let us forget that the epistemological development is not toward death, but toward the timeless renewal. So that vertical line would be life or spring. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Next up is going to be Mark. Mark, go ahead. Thanks, and I think I understand what Nick was saying, that it's not as if uh, three unbroken lines is always going to represent heaven, but the the unbroken line and the broken line are always what they are, and yet in every different of the sixty four combinations, they have a different valence and a different operation. I think that's what you were saying. Hopefully, I understand that. Um, and I'm also wondering, Quan, if the, another sense of four can be found in the combination of the yin and yang lines in, in, in the combination of four where you have two yin or two yang lines or a yin over a yang or a yang over a yin, those four are kind of basic in constructing the eight, aren't they? Absolutely. I want to say again the uh, basic cosmology of uh, those people. Okay, first, Wu Qi Sheng, 
有极 ，OK， meaning 无极 means the infinite, the formless, creator, the one. OK， 有极 is the one. Last time I I say to you that if I take the fifty yarrow sticks, when I say 无极 I don't show the yarrow sticks. OK, formless. 无极生有极 Here you have the one. And 有极生太极 meaning the one manifests as the supreme timelessness and time, being and becoming, principles and phenomena. Okay, and there you have a Tai Chi Shang Su Xiang. Okay. Tai Chi meaning the one as separated from the phenomena, but the one manifesting as a three timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth for the construction of the outside universe, but also the construction of the inner universe. So Tai Chi Sheng Su Xiang, and here I go to that possible other understanding of four, the supreme or the timelessness separated with time, the three timeless form, create the four images. And that is the four images are exactly what you just said, okay? You have uh, either the great yang, two plain line, the great yin, two broken line, the small yang, meaning you have uh, on the top, a plain line and on the bottom a broken line or the small yin on the top a broken line with under a plain line. And that is the other interpretation possible of the meaning of four in China, Chinese thinking, okay? One is the four graph or the four lines for the character Wang for, for the epistemological sovereignty. Two is the four seasons, but not only in physical reality, but in terms of development of man and of his mind. And that four that I just explained, which is uh, the cosmological four. And from the four images, you have the eight trigrams. And from the eight trigrams, you get the 64 hexagrams. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Joe. Can you actually explain really quickly the inner universe and the outer universe a little bit more in detail that you just yes. mentioned? Yes, well, the inner universe is precisely the character Wang, okay? The epistemological development from the lower trigram made by sense perception, intellect, so social sophistication, and the upper trigram of the form of beauty corresponding in time to justice, to the powers of the mind capable to uphold justice, okay? It's long to say, but it's uh, worth to say that because that what this means, okay? For line four, your epistemological development is at the timeless form of beauty, making you capable to have the, endowing you with the mind powers to uphold justice in time. Mm -hmm. And line five, goodness in timelessness, corresponding to the mind powers, making you capable of creativity, of inventivity, of discovery, of dialectical playfulness, of playful exploration is another way to say it, and of moderation. And line six, the last of the hexagram and the last of the upper trigram, truth in timelessness corresponding to the mind powers of wisdom in specific situation, okay? That is the inner adventure. The outer adventure is precisely what I, what I just said, uh, what I explained with the uh, 50 yarrow sticks, uh, meaning that you have uh, formless will create uh, the one, the one will manifest as the three timeless form of beauty, goodness, and truth. Uh, and after that, it will create uh, the four images. After that, you have uh, the eight trigrams in the, immobile uh, sequence of Fu Si and after in the dynamic sequence of King One. And finally, the 64 configurations of the 
symbolized by the 64 hexagrams. Okay, that is would be more the outside reality. But let's not forget that the two are simply the two sides of the same coin. So that makes sense to me. And the, so um, the idea of uh, synchronicity is kind of between the inner and outer. Would that be an appropriate statement? Yes, it could be uh, between the inner and the outer for a person, but it can also be the synchronicity of two minds uh, vibrating at the same level of energy or at the same uh, uh, lines of the hexagram development, if you want, okay? Uh, two person at lines three or two, two person at line four and five, or even two person at two different lines, but having a commonality in a given situation. You don't have to be at the same lines of epistemological development to be friends, so you can be friends, even if you are two different lines, but having something in common in a given situation. And because to one to one degree, actually, I it's a um, supposedly the I Ching had a huge influence on Young. So could it be the same mind in conscious and unconscious? Yeah, that is very legit as interpretation. That's for sure. Okay. All right. Because let's not forget that uh, what Young would call the subconscious and the unconscious would be in the animal kingdom in the uh, eating model okay animal kingdom divine reality and what is conscious or super conscious would be of course in the divine reality divine here has to be understood as in the super conscious reality okay let's not forget that the vertical line of the character wang king is the ascension of awareness of infinite awareness Okay, and once again, I want to remind that episteme in Greek means infinite awareness, okay? That is most of the time translated in a very lame manner as knowledge, but I think I said that last time. Okay, I stop my answer here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Mark. First of all, thank you so much, Quan, for doing this. I, I think it's a two session meet up on the I Ching as a, as a break in our discussion of the Tao Te Ching. And it's been really, really fascinating. Uh, my last question for tonight, I, I don't know if it's going to be my last, if we're going to keep going or not, but in the sequence that you just mentioned, from the formless to the one, then the one, creating the three forms of beauty, truth, and goodness to creating the four images of the greater and lesser yin and yang. And then the eight inner trigrams of Pu Shi and the eight outer trigrams of King Wen. It seems like the most difficult step is from the unformed to the one and what are some of the secrets you know I'm thinking about the Nasadaya Sutra from the Rig Veda 10 129 where it ends up being a kind of mystery that's always been one of my favorites so what does the I Ching have to tell us about that movement from the unlimited or unformed to the one? I would say that um, for the I Ching as for, in the, for the Tao Te Ching, because you have the same mindset in those two books, right? uh, it would be the same answer. And what a synchronicity, because I have section seven and section eight of the Ta Chuang of the Great Commentary just under my eyes. And I want to read them to you because I think it's part of the answer. Okay. Okay. The, here the master said that the master is Confucius. Okay. So because let's not forget that traditionally all the 10 chapters of the 10 wings have been attributed to Confucius. So section seven of the first part of the Ta Chuang. The master said, is not E supreme. And E here is the change and the unchange, okay? Because once again, 
Chain, E means changing and also unchanging. The master said, it's not E supreme, but E sage to exalt the powers and widen the activities. Wisdom and nobles, courtesy humbles, and noblemen matches heaven. Humility imitates earth. Heaven and earth both stand in place and change operates between them. Perfected nature is maintained as a gate for the tightness of Tao, okay? So that passage from the formless to the one, I think that is a kind of answer that is, I read again, once again, the last four lines. Heaven and earth both stand in place and change operates between them. Okay, so here I understand it's spontaneous, perfected nature is maintained as a gate for the tightness of of Tao, the tightness of Tao, of Tao, I understand it as uh, you, you have the channel that is spontaneous. Okay, it, that is uh, the, the the way is clear. You you cannot air into the, uh, the the highway of the Tao of the way. And I want to read the beginning of chapter the section eight of the first part of the Ta Chuang, the Great Commentary uh, on the I Ching. Sages could see all the mysteries under heaven and follow, follow, following their form and appearance, make appropriate representations of them, which are therefore called figures. Sage could see all activities under heaven and observing the act, interaction, work out the laws and rights that they added statesmen and good and ill fortunes, which are therefore called oracles. Though they speak of all mysteries under heaven, they do nothing wrong. Though they speak of all activities under heaven, they cause no confusion. Calculate, then speak, consider, then act. By calculation and consideration, all alternation and transformation can be managed. Here, the second part is more about man, but I would say that it is an imitation of the spontaneous uh, operation between heaven and earth that is happening in the Tao, okay? All alternation and transformation can be managed either at the level of the Tao, the universal Tao, or at the level of the Tao of the superior man. I don't think it's a complete answer, but I would say that it, it's an answer that goes in the sense of your question. And I'm happy that it's not my answer, but it's section seven and eight of the first part of the Ta Chuang. Thank you. Thank you. Kwan. Kwan, thank you so much for doing this. This is great introduction to I Ching. Would love to do more of this in the future. So folks, we're going to be back to doing the Tao uh, from next uh, Tuesday onwards. So we will see you soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.